Hello and welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. My guest today is Matt Strippelhoff. Hello, Matt, who's a partner and CEO of Red Hawk Technologies, an award-winning software and app development company. So welcome to the show, Matt. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Thank you very much. Well, this is a great topic. I know that we're there's a lot of conversation about AI. People are interested for some reason. I don't know. There there's, seems to be a buzz happening out there. Uh, but this is a great topic. Um, I've actually had some people asking questions around this topic. So navigating the AI shift and balancing technology and, and talent in development. So how, what happens to my development team? What's changing and what they do? What do we need to be thinking about? And what's different about customers, what they're asking for? Kind of all those things. We'll get into all that. But Matt, first, why don't you introduce yourself more broadly, talk about what your company does. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm the founder of Red Hawk Technologies. We started the company in uh, the spring of 2008 during the recession. It's a great time to start a company. Actually, it worked out really well for us in the end. <laughs> And uh, we focus on serving mid-market clients that don't have DevOps uh, or senior uh, engineers and development practices in-house. And uh, uh, by doing so, we developed and evolved a very unique business model. We develop, support, and maintain custom business applications to help mid-market clients innovate all through a managed service contract model. So they actually have financial and operational stability. Uh, it's very unique. It's, it's led to exponential growth in the business, and we're pretty excited about it. Well, and I, it's a great model. As we were talking about before we got started, I mean that the whole idea is that, uh, like, I provide something similar over the marketing side. I do fractional CMO. Like, not mm -hmm. everybody can afford to go put an entire team in place and all the overhead and the costs around that. But they need more than just hiring one or two developers. They need to have an experienced team, all the functions, and drop that in. And it's much more cost effective to go pull in a partner and do that and build that in your model and then pay as you go or whatever, you know, whatever the model is. So then you, you're not paying for, you know, 10 employees, 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week. Um, but you're, you, you've got a reduced, you know, overhead model that is, you could go and plan around that. Absolutely. Well, and the other thing that's really nice about it is that we understand DevOps. We understand best practice. We do things like maintain software building materials. We scan it for emerging common vulnerabilities and exposures. This is language that our clients, they don't understand the need for that type of recurring proactive maintenance that, that's really required to secure the applications that we develop. Um, but uh, really maintain that as an asset so it doesn't turn into a liability overnight. And so the clients that really struggle out there, not our clients, but companies that struggle, I think, are ones who still treat web and mobile application efforts as if they're projects with a beginning, middle, and end. And then they find out later when there's an issue that, oh boy, we didn't really know how to continue to reinvest properly to maintain that asset. And we solved that problem. You know, it's a very similar selling point to the whole software as a service model. It's like, why are we... Uh, you know, I, I came up through in the Microsoft ecosystem system as a SharePoint guy and yeah. all these organizations that you go to a conference, you hear all these talks and it was all about keeping servers up and, and running and having the right level of expertise in house to be able to do those things. And like, why? I mean, all of that, I mean, again, you're, you're putting all that operational infrastructure in place on something that is not your core competency and is not what your business is focused on, mm -hmm. focus on the business, have the experts or have the SaaS software, the solution go and provide those things. So it's again, pretty, pretty similar models. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So let's, let's jump in. Uh, so what interests you about the intersection of AI and software development specifically? <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. What doesn't interest me? I, I'm fascinated by it. I love process. I, I like solving big problems and, and uh, taking on big challenges. And so I'm super excited about what's going on in that space. 
from, from an operational standpoint as a CEO, as I, as I think about my team and the impact it has on the development resources, I, I'm, I'm concerned about how they feel about it. How, how do they feel it's going to impact their future, their jobs? And I'm very um, interested in, in how those who are readily embracing it, what benefits they're realizing in, in addressing all of those concerns and opportunities. And there's far more opportunities than there is concern. And, and so I'm really excited to see how it's impacting routine activity and work in our business. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of little um, benefits I can touch on. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to see it and how it's affecting our business. It, it's, I know it seems so fast paced, like that it, it is. I mean, there's so much that's happening so quickly, but I know that for, for those of us that work in tech, I mean, there's been, there's a lot that's been happening over the last decade, oh, yeah. uh, certainly moving towards AI. Have you, have you seen kind of a, a, a path in your own team and your own activities with your clients where you're starting to see the AI tools slowly being integrated into how you work, how you develop, how you deliver? Absolutely. You know, the first thing that, that we did is, is uh, start to explore what's available in the marketplace and then uh, put in an AI policy in the business. And that's more for security and training purposes than anything. We've got to make sure we're not making big mistakes like you see in the news when the developers taking somebody's proprietary code and putting it out into a large language model. And guess what? Now it's part of that model forever. That's so we have to protect ourselves against making those types of um, uninformed mistakes. So that's the first thing that we did. Um, and, and then we're, we're exploring uh, on our own dime, we're exploring a lot of the tools that are available to see which ones are going to be most beneficial to our clients. And then how do we make that part of our routine practice? Well, and, what and, were some of the, the, the early, like what, what are the places, like where did you see those efficiencies, those benefits of AI early on? Well, you know, we're seeing that, that our, our junior and associate level engineers are able to ramp up much faster than they were historically just by using Copilot AI, for example, and, and uh, asking for uh, information on a function, you know, right. And, and this is really interesting, very specific um, method that one of our senior engineers introduced to lar large members of our team. They just basically said, you know, I found that it's really useful in a practical application is to take a function because oftentimes we take over support and maintenance of existing business applications. Yeah. We're not always building, it's not always greenfield. And, and so when we inherit someone else's code and it's not well commented and we're looking at functions, we need to understand what that function is really doing. We're asking AI to write the comments for us. Mm -hmm. And that a little simple things like that have gone a long way. On the flip side, uh, we're, we've experimented with um, writing the comments first and then saying, hey, write the function. Now, where it's still limited is it's not going to handle complex business logic. It's really not going to do that. You still need your senior engineers. You still need that top talent and knowledge workers, but it's expediting the decision-making process. It's helping them think through um, think through the code more efficiently. And, and so that's a more practical way that we're using it on the development side um, in-house. And then uh, we're getting all kinds of crazy wild questions from our clients about AI, as you might expect, because there's so much buzz in the news and some of it is, there's so much hype. Yeah, it's always interesting to look to at the, in fact, I saw somebody presenting uh, this last week and they had uh, like a technology, that, like the hype cycle um, and they all of these different technologies that where they were in that cycle. Hmm. And for a lot of people like generative AI is it's coming on the downside of the hype it's still pretty high up there, but as people, it's just one of those things. There's nothing wrong with with dropping down afterwards. It's the like everybody's excited about. Hey, look at the new capabilities. But when you start to look at the practical application of that, mm -hmm. um, the 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 other like the risks around it and kind of it, it just is again. It goes back to with you mentioned with the large language language mo model. Is well, where is that hosted? Is it my model? Is it a public consumer grade model? Like mm -hmm. where that is? So am I spending all this time with my intellectual property building something that, that is just open to the world or am I doing it in a controlled way? Like any new technology that I tell customers, like you, you need to understand the, how that new technology works and where that is before you invest too much in it, understand the basics of those things, mm -hmm. they'll make much better decisions, especially around the risk profile of that technology. Absolutely. And, and I think for a lot of 
people right now, AI is still a solution looking for a problem in their business that's worth solving. So we see that as well, you know? And so a lot of the more practical applications that we're developing for our clients are around intelligent search solutions to help their knowledge workers. Yeah. It's, it's taking advantage of AI's ability to handle unstructured data so well. Mm-hmm. In natural language processing combined with unstructured data Man, that's when you get into some really good use cases that can move, move the, the 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 needle on the bottom line and really have powerful you know outcome for the business. You know what's so funny about all this? Then uh, just talk about how long some of this has been around. I, I had my my first startup, which I co-founded during business school back in '97. We mm-hmm. sold it in in early 2001. Uh, but what we were going and 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 building, uh, and what later was termed, we didn't know to call it that, but as a social graph, like pulling together the connections between all these, these data points, the, all the things that are out there. Um, again, it was, it was brand new. Nobody was doing something. I came from information management background and uh, data warehousing and that, that side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we weren't able to do what we can do today, but again, a lot of those ideas, those concepts of doing pattern recognition to be able to utilize uh, as and not do rework like hey we went and built something similar if it starts to recognize the pattern to pull out logic or even code snippets that mm-hmm. were the output of that project that's an 80 percent match to what i've just entered in and speed up that that delivery cycle by reusing those components like that was the whole concept of my little software company again that was you know sold in 2001 so Man, it just it just is getting further and further away. It makes me feel old every time I talk about it. <laughs> you, you know, all this innovation always starts w- 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 with that type of work, right? There's there's this history that that people are not really privy to unless you're in the software engineering space. You don't realize how long machine learning and and these types of tools and and pattern recognition, as you mentioned, and, and solutions like that have been developed and leveraged to support businesses. It's been around for a really long time. It's just all this recent hype. And I think it's the natural language processing piece and be able to ask your machine questions in that natural language, in that natural language. I think that's really where the, 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 all these breakthroughs, and it seems like it's all brand new. It's really not right. Um, but it's really powerful stuff. And I think we're at a really interesting inflection point. Well, that's the other side of that too, is that we didn't have the internet in the way that we have available now. I mean, well, yeah, we had the internet in 2001, but I mean, we had to, we were partnering with companies like, like IBM, uh, with, a, a connection as our poster with mm-hmm. a company called objectivity, because the models we were building were massive and they were all in servers that we had to then go and pay for. We couldn't go and scale it using, you know, Azure or Amazon or whatever else, you know, for, for that, that, that supports all of our solutions now. And so again, that, we're just able to do things now that we couldn't 20 years ago. Well, that's that's absolutely right. And it's a, it's a great point to make as well as, as just the amount of data that's available in these large language models that now have the APIs available for us to dip into and dip out of, right? So uh, w- when you're developing a secure AI solution for your client and, and keeping all of that IP proprietary information contained. It's not part of these large language models, but you can still dip into those large language models to help out with the natural language processing pieces. So it really understands what your intent is to then interpret and come back and again, in natural language with the response that you need, but still securing your data. Well, that only works because the massive amounts of data that's now available in, in chat GPT and in, in Claude, et cetera. Right. So um, yeah, that's, I think, that's where the newness is, the excitement. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a great time to be in this business. I, I know some other people that might look at it like they're terrified, like we're we're gonna you know it's all gonna replace us. And, you know we can use AI to, to to develop the applications without human intervention. That's just not the case. You still need your knowledge workers, your expertise. Well, and a lot of the other, the fear too, and again, coming from the information management space, knowledge management space, and I understand the the, the concerns. And if you go into sure. the public sector, I mean, government entities, like even more concern and rightfully so, again, you have mm-hmm. to understand what are the tools, the applications that we're, we're using? What are the systems? Where are those libraries? Where, what is happening to this data? 
I mean, that's why, I mean, Microsoft is taking a very much, as they always do, more of the enterprise approach. Sure. So their solutions with Copilot, like it's encapsulated. It's, you know, that container is, it's your data. It's not going and sharing that with the world that's out mm. there. Mm -hmm. If you're paying with the credit card for an online tool, it's likely you're training that model that everybody else has access to. So that's something to think about too. Uh, so yeah, the, and then with all of the other, the more creative we get with the technology and AI, uh, the more creative the hackers get and the risk profile becomes stronger. I think that's another reason why we see so many security, you know, companies popping up every, every month um, around this space because it's just, it's a growing need. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, bad actors are, are, early adopters, right? They're going to, they're going right. <laughs> to, they're going to figure out how to exploit and they're going to move fast. Yep. Well, so how do you see some of the traditional roles shifting or Im improving in development teams kind of going forward? And, and, and like what I, I'm sure your approach for your customers, I mean, because you're looking at that operational efficiency as well. Like mm -hmm. you've got that ongoing contract with them, but if you can do as much or more, with fewer people, you know, that makes your, uh, uh, your, your efficiency go up. It's like, so what is happening with some of those traditional roles? Within our organization, the traditional roles really haven't been impacted. We're introducing new roles and, and the new roles are around AI expertise. So we, we don't have the designated person for this necessarily, but we, we have several that are on track of an AI czar in-house. I, uh, We have to be able to bring the expertise to our clients because they don't have it. Mm -hmm. it. And so we have to make significant investments to ramp up skill set, explore the tools that are available, develop the expertise that we can then bring to our customers at our cost. And so um, I, I see new roles in the organization, not necessarily losing or changing roles in the organization. Yeah, I guess that's that, you know, looking at what skills people should go and add. I mean, you've got the traditional path because you still need people that understand the mechanics of software development. I mean, those, the pieces haven't changed. Absolutely. Um, where some of the libraries are, where they exist and how they're accessed, you know, what you're going to, what the, the, the front end looks like might evolve and change, but those principles are the same. Um, I know I've got, uh, you know, two kids that uh, both started in the science different science backgrounds. One uh, was uh, microbiology. The other one was atmospheric science, like their undergrads. Mm -hmm. And they're both now in their jobs are data scientists, one in healthcare, one in atmospheric sciences. But they're like, uh, one is hardcore R Python, uh, more on the engineering side. The other one is more the analytics Power BI Tableau expert and but doing a lot of the, the same things. And I do seem to recall telling both of them that data science was an important area with what they were going into and they should consider, I don't know, maybe minoring in the area or something or other, but uh, it may give them an early jump. And uh, it's, you know, they always ha hate it when dad was right in what he told them <laughs> that they didn't do, you know. Well, I think that's sage advice because, uh, you know, the model models and AI solutions are regardless of, of if it's right, wrong, or, or it's a loose, it's going to give you a response. Yeah. And if you don't understand your data, then how, how in the heck are you going to be able to train that model to the level of accuracy that you need in order to approve it for uh, routine use in a production environment? You got to have people that really understand data. Uh, they have to understand um, uh, uh, the, the mathematics behind that. Mm -hmm. um, they have to understand how limited data can it can influence the outcome, and it could be incorrect. Uh, there's all kinds of impacts that um, uh, that that come to play. Are there certain skills that you struggle to find people with the those with that experience or those those specific skill sets? You know, we we we've, we've been able to provide enough latitude and in investment to train people that show aptitude for developing AI solutions that we're okay at the moment, but I'm sure that as we continue to scale and grow, we're going to find more challenges in finding people in the marketplace that have experience. It's 
developing AI solutions is still new enough that it's not something that, 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 you know, the younger generations learning in, in their computer science classes to a level of, of effectiveness that they can just roll in and be an expert when they come yeah. right out of college. It's just not there yet. And so, um, yeah, I, see, I, I know I see a lot of roles that are in the, again, I put it in the under classified under the data science, but are the, the data platform side of things that are, mm -hmm. um, I mean, back in, you know, 30 years ago, I mean, I look at those people I work side by side with, I was a technical PM and mm -hmm. I worked with DBAs. I worked oh, yeah. with the people that lived and breathed inside and owned the, those systems. And that was a big part of my job. I owned all the front end applications on all of that, but was, you know, I'd go to my DBAs depending on the organization or the data set. I worked for Pacific Bell back. Way okay. Back then. So, yeah. um, you know, so it, the, each of those, I knew exactly where to go, who to go, who owned or which teams owned each of those giant chunks of data back in the day. But having people that understand the data side of it uh, and then can go in and implement again the data science side of it, read it, find insights from that data. Like I, I, I can see job postings all over the place for those. Mm -hmm. I know that again, Microsoft that I work closely with, yeah, they, they, they can't find people fast enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that for us, a lot of the subject matter expertise around the data is provided by the clients. I think about things like uh, 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 chief financial officer in, mm -hmm. in the way they want to interpret the data. A lot of times what's happening is that interpretation happens in an Excel file. What the DBA sees in the database and the way that it's architected, it should, hopefully it's all nice and clean, but that's not necessarily where the interpretation happens. Yeah. Uh, and, and so sometimes the level of expertise you need sits with the subject matter expert on the client side or the business side, and it's not really on the develop, development side. So there's a collaboration that has to happen there. Well, that's, uh, well, I agree with that wholeheartedly, you know, hence the name of the podcast, right? Uh, Collab talk around that. Oh, it, yeah, because it's a, you know, because uh, we don't work in silos. Mm -mm. Uh, and, and so we, we, we get so much more done by, uh, uh, you know, collaborating with others and getting their inputs, their perspectives on, on those things, but especially around the AI space. I mean, you talk about, you've got your subject matter experts like, like the CFO, that mm -hmm. knows the output that they're looking for, uh, but still needs help with the cleanup of that data. That mm -hmm. seems to be like a missing piece. People, you know, like you've talked about the unstructured data and being able to go to the, an AI can work miracles and going and finding patterns and different things. You still need to do data cleanup and massaging of that oh, to yeah. get those other results. And people seem to forget about that piece. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, this is old school, right? We're thinking about the days when we were doing uh, large, uh, not large language, sorry, machine learning solutions and things like that. The first thing we looked at is the data. Most, most initiatives will start with a discovery engagement of some kind because you have to root through the assumptions that the business is making. Most businesses assume their data is in great shape. <laughs> And I come back to the CFO and I'm thinking uh, about, you know, uh, specific scenarios in, our, in my experience where the CFO is like the data is in great shape. Well, how do you know that? Well, I can demonstrate that in these Excel files that I've got. Well, there's a lot of manipulation that happens between your data sets, which might be partially in ERP, um, uh, par partially in um, uh, human resource, human capital management solutions, mm -hmm. partially in a CRM platform. Uh, if somebody's bringing all that together for you and prepping data in a format that you can then work with it in Excel, what's happening in those steps? Yeah. There well, might be a lot of manipulation to your data to get it clean enough to where it's useful for you in Excel. A great example of that is like I went and did a, uh, a, a Power BI course in mm. person with a partner sat through the classes. I'm thinking, okay, I get it. So for basic navigation, I'm not in doing those things. I was just kind of doing it so that I understood the inner workings of the, the solution. And this is like seven, eight years ago around that. Not yeah. that I was going to go in and build any dashboards or visualizations there, but I wanted to understand the, the, the basics. And so I, 
it was one of those you're sitting in the class and you've got like their workstations and going through their examples for the coursework. I'm like, hey, I got this. So then I had the full licensing and I go out and I, I grab some data and I go to try to like implement what I learned. And I'm like, yeah, no, there are so many steps in between that we're missing from that. You can't just take the raw data. But that's what, I mean, even with Copilot, the demos around Excel, Copilot for Excel mm -hmm. were some of the coolest things. And it was with those initial demos when it was all announced, it was all smoke and mirrors and and wires uh holding things up none of it was real i mean we're still waiting for some of the features that they showed in the demo that somehow they faked through it it wasn't really real around that hmm. but to be able to go in and take this massive spreadsheet and say you know like what are the three primary trends that you're seeing so natural language to to look for that pattern recognition and find things that you might find it, see it, if you can see the matrix. It, you might see it by looking at this mass of things, but in seconds, it pulls up and can give you summarize. Like you should look at, we're seeing this downward trend here, and this is moving up here. Like I, I did, you don't have to go build something to do that. Again, I don't know what's there, folks. Don't go looking yet. Um, I, I do your homework of what is actually there with Copilot for Excel, but that's where it's going. Mm -hmm. but we're just not quite there yet. But. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that we see a lot of now and the subject comes up often is human in the loop, you know, and keeping that, that uh, knowledge worker in the mix. And I think this is one thing that a lot of people don't recognize yet that who, who have not invested in AI, developing the AI solution for their business is that unlike any other type of tech investment, it takes time for that AI to, reach enough value, well, to, to uh, is training, right? It's training over time, right? You have to train the AI solution. And so it's an extended investment. It's not like, okay, we're going to build this field service application. We're going to go through a design process, wireframes, clickable prototypes, execute, build it, integrate it with your ERP and CRM platform. You're done. Now go use it. AI solutions, unlike those types of projects, they improve in quality over time, as long as you have a quality program and training program in the mix. And that's where a lot of the knowledge workers who might be afraid of getting replaced, that's where they're still adding a great deal of value is in training the model. And I think what we saw with the industrial revolution is going to be the same type of thing we see with the AI uh, revolution and, and modernizing tech is that we're not going to see jobs go away. We're going to see an increase in throughput. So we're going to see a, a, the same size teams and groups uh, be able to produce a lot more output through the use of AI solutions. Well, it goes back to like the, my story of the early days of SharePoint, where you had people that were focused on keeping the servers up and running. Mm. Those people didn't. I, I know there was there were some job shifts and changes there, though, but those people with that knowledge that didn't go away. They just moved to now the business outputs using SharePoint. You know, it was mm -hmm. like, it, it's the same thing. It's, it's, you need to have people that understand the the business side and what's needed and what the, the output is. Um, and that understands how the technology works to be able to get the most out of it. That's why I, I realize it's an overused and we've moved on from the phrase of digital transformation, but that's where most people I think got it wrong of what digital transformation was. It's not about moving to the latest, greatest technology. You didn't have a digital transformation on older technology, but the transformation happens because it's a business transformation. You're getting more output. You're more aligned. You're getting the most out of your technology investments mm -hmm. versus just moving to the latest, greatest, that, that yeah. version of it. It's, it's another reason why I love Microsoft's branding around Copilot. It's not the pilot, it's the Copilot. It You have to have the pilot, which is the human, there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's about the pilot being able to do more, to take those bathroom breaks, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but it, it, but have that assistance there. And there's a lot more you can accomplish. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. So what, what do you see like organizationally? Um, are there adjustments organizations need to make 
to fully leverage AI in development? Yes, I think they do need to make some adjustments from an organizational standpoint. They probably need to designate an owner. It could be an existing leader in the business or subject matter expert to help them determine how to best leverage AI to improve business outcomes. Somebody's got to own that. And I don't think that's just uh, uh, a side job or, or, or add this to your normal routine work. I think those who are really going to get the most out of AI are those who are going to say, okay, this is going to be your job. This is what you're going to do for us now. And maybe it's a transition over, over time. Maybe it's they're spending half their week on it to, to try and figure this out. One thing AI is not going to provide and I tell people all this all the time, it's not going to provide vision. Right. right. It'll, it'll, it'll provide insights, but only if you have an idea of what the insights might be and you can train the AI to go looking for the things that you think are important to the business and provide you with the response that you need to make business decisions. But somebody's got to formulate the vision. That's not going to come from AI. Well, you know, it's similar to that. I, I, I had an argument with somebody who was talking about, because I'm as a content creator. I, I write a lot. That's kind of my, my strength on the writing side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and somebody said, well, nobody's going to be writing stuff anymore. I was like, why? It's because AI is like, no, AI is summarizing. It's pulling the insights. There's still, is AI going to go into original thought that goes around it? I mean, the human brain, the ability, like I, like a memory is sparked by a scent. Mm -hmm. Like, like uh, honestly, the other day, like I smelled somebody had a cologne on that was like a buddy of mine when I was a teenager, was like 16 years old. Like, I swear it was the exact same cologne, which made me think like, oh, I've not talked to Scott in that, that time. I mean, that like the way the human brain is able to make connections, which make absolutely no sense that, that AI will not be able to do like, like that to go in. But you're right. We have to make decisions. We'll, we'll have other inputs and other insights that may take us in a completely different direction to go and create net new, authentic, original content that AI will then go in, move in, synthesize, bring it in, summarize all those things, you know, mm -hmm. from, from that. But you still have to go and make decisions around that data. That part definitely doesn't change. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So I think that's the big organizational changes. They have to designate somebody to, to form the vision. And maybe it's an, maybe it's the CEO, maybe it's somebody else in the business that's providing vision in other areas. I'm not sure, you know, that's up well, to the indi individual organizations to decide, but um, yeah. Well, just like you've seen the rise of the, the CISO, the, the chief information security officer, mm -hmm. which a lot of that used to just fall under the CIO, but you mm -hmm. know, it may be, maybe the, the CIO is the right place or the CTO for the AI piece. Maybe eventually you have somebody that's a chief automation or chief AI officer that just looks at that piece. But there's a there's a fundamental important piece to this. Again, I'll put my project manager hat on for this, uh, is that you need to be looking at your process, the methodology, these the, all the tools constantly. I always bring up W. Edwards Deming, I'm a fan of, but that operational, like you're you're constantly looking at, even if you're like, we're at 99% efficiency, or like, all right, let's start working at on the 1%, yes, but also other factors will change that'll drop us down from the 99. So you have to continually look at improving. And it's true for these, these tools as well. You're not going to be 100% efficient out the door on the use of any of these things. It's going to get take time. It's going to take team member input, customer partner input on those things to get more out of that. And as fast as you increase efficiency, then business changes, technology changes happen um, that force you to continue working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Continuous improvement. It's a big, it's a, it's, it's a concept that plays right into how AI can have a positive impact on the business. And depending on the scale of the business, you might have a PMO. The project management organization working closely with, with operations, that's generally what they're going to be doing is looking for ways to improve efficiency, measure improvement, a lot of special projects around uh, automation. AI is part of the conversation for those companies already, I'm sure. Your mid-market companies that that don't have PMOs, um, they'll have to designate somebody else on their team 
and and that's where I think it, it's probably going to whoever that is, it's, they're going to be working very closely with with the C suite. Yeah. Have Have you also seen customer expectations start to shift around AI? I mean, is it an expected part of the conversation? I mean, if you're because if your company is brought in on yeah. building something, building a solution, and the ongoing support of that, um, whether it's internal or for an external product, I'm assuming you help with both of those things. We do. Um, uh, is there an expectation now that there's AI components to that? Yeah. In fact, we, 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 we're using the phrase loosely at this point, but we're, we're taking an, an AI first approach. You kind of remember when, when mobile devices came on strong, you've been in the business long enough to remember when, you know, the first mobile devices didn't have, <laughs> you, you know, were, screens, they, smart, did very they were smart devices. They, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and so once the, uh, you know, once the, the, the technology advanced to the point where we needed to support a mobile first experience, well, it's the same concept. It's now it's an AI first experience. And I think it, we can thank the, the, uh, the big players. We can thank Apple. We can thank Microsoft, Google, et cetera, for setting the bar so high for the customer experience. And that customer, we're all customers. Right. And, and, and so in the business setting, your customers are your end users and maybe they're internal, maybe they're external to your business. But they have this idea that there's a certain level of experience they're expecting based on what they have every day with their mobile device. And so this idea of an AI assistant as being part of almost every mobile app or web application. Yeah, we're talking about that all the time. Do you find that you're having to uh communicate the benefits of of AI and this this approach or do customers kind of inherently get it or are they even kind of ahead of you again the, the, where the the expectations are are you having to explain any of how that fits into like your model we're, we're finding more often than not that we're having to lower expectations based on the data and and sources that are available from the customer because generally the, the the vision is being set by leadership. Most of our, most of the people that we're working with are in the C-suite. Mm -hmm. And so they're providing vision. They're excited about these breakthroughs that are possible through AI. They want to explore them. Many of them are going to have a certain level of skepticism and they're going to understand that there might, a discovery engagement is going to be required first. So we can kind of drill in to see what's actually feasible. Yeah. Based on their, where they are as a business. And so I think people have a, the companies we're working with have a healthy enough level of skepticism to allow us to, to drill in and then level set. But knowing that we can use a lot of unstructured data to generate intelligent search solutions and expedite the user's experience, mm -hmm. that that's where the expectation is today. And, and that's something we can almost always readily meet. So we're pretty excited about where things sit right now. I wonder when the first lawsuit that we're going to see of like a development organization or a project management organization against uh, the in-flight magazines for <laughs> painting unrealistic pictures of what's possible <laughs> with new tech. And that's, I'm like, I've had that where I had an executive who literally brought like a Delta, the, whatever the name of theirs was, you know, the in-flight magazine is like, I read this article because people, you can take them. They're if you want to take it you can and you know, it brought it back and just like oh, see what it says about here it was like yeah yeah that's yeah that's not available yet you know like that that thing like uh so yeah i so i get that the, they may be higher up on the hype cycle than where things generally are coming down on the other side of what's actually possible yeah you know and th that conversation is something that we're comfortable with in general because we, we we saw it for so many years in mobile application projects, for example. So we're talking to a mid-market client and they're like, oh, it's got to be easy because I've seen that um, functionality in this application I have on my phone. So how hard is it? Somebody's already done it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, you know, it's like, well, you don't, you don't know that there's millions of dollars that have been invested to get that application to that point. Yeah, those are the people that invented that technology that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So, right, right. Yeah. Well, that, and then the other side of it too is, and, and I know we, we touched on this briefly at the beginning here, but you talk about like some of the ethical considerations for mm. deploying and using these technologies. And it's, I, I mean, it is something that 
again, project management background, a lot of it was risk management. It's like, look, here's sometimes like there's not a clear direction. Here are the options. Here are the concerns. We need to make a decision on this or not make a decision and move forward on it. But like, here's what we don't know. We'll do our best, but here's what the the risk management is. And it's it's kind of a project management 101 is that like, look, the, the sooner you identify the risk and and you you uh, you continue to monitor that risk and as, as the project moves forward whether it go the risk goes up or down um, based on what you're learning as you as you progress and you communicate thoroughly on that you have that co- conversation but there i mean there's some things that we just know and I, as we talked about previously like there are public solutions commercial solutions of where that large language model lives and where the data lives, what it does. It's like, um, I don't have TikTok on my phone because I understand that the data, where it goes and what happens to it, and that is, I do not approve. So Mm -hmm. that's why I do not use that app. That's why a lot of people are uh, coming to learn that uh, Facebook has uh owns everything you've ever posted on facebook i mean you need to as painful as they make and they intentionally obscure what's happening with your data the access you're giving through the the complexity of those agreements there Mm -hmm. there there should be new regulations to tighten that up you know some somehow have an msa type model where there's all the the other legal jargon and and force them to have spell it out in like two pages, you know, exactly what you're agreeing to, and then refer to the service, the master service agreement for that app. Um, that we need to move that to that kind of model. Um, so, what are the ethical consider- considerations that you talk to your clients about? We talk to them about generative AI and and what risk that might bring to them. Now, we're not attorneys; we're not going to help them to figure out how to mitigate risk. But if we're looking at an AI solution that's gonna rely on some level of generative AI, we have to let them know that the AI solution's job is to generate something. And it's going to generate something. The level of accuracy of what it generates, we have some control over. So for example, if we do a closed uh, solution, leveraging only the client data and and, uh, very specific prompt training, the level of accuracy is going to be much greater than if you're leveraging large language models that are publicly available and you're just taking that prompt and sending it out to the ether and saying, let's see what it comes back with. Well, if you're, if you're putting your brand on that and you're relying on an open source, large language model, that's generative in nature to come back and generate something that you're charging for to that Mm -hmm. end client. I think that's where there's a lot of risk. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. There's uh, again, that's why I love the, I was just part of what I presented on last week was talking about, uh, again, my Microsoft partner. So I'm very much in that ecosystem, but the ability to go and create the personal SharePoint co-pilots mm. is incredibly powerful. So I've trained the one I'm testing on. Um, I've been blogging. My blog has been alive since uh, uh, February of, of 2004. So it's just over 20 years old. Mm-hmm. And so I've got it trained on everything I've ever written on there as well as what my OneNote, those are the two primary sources of data that it has gone. I've had to push other data and anything else that I can then, I grab and move in there. So when it's responding, it's responding based on my knowledge, my IP, like that side. So I know it's secure. It's not going outside and training that. Mm -hmm. What you give up is one of the strengths of the LLM on the consumer grade which is the creativity, like uh, the scope of everything else that it knows. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually experimenting where I'm doing kind of nondescript, just like research, creative research, you know, leveraging the public models and then looking and saying, well, what data, what, what, how do I modify the prompts, the, the training on my closed model to get closer to what I'm, I'm looking for. And it's, uh, again, I'm seeing the limitations, but that's just one of the experiments that I'm doing. Yeah, it's it's incredibly tedious, right? You know, it's, it it's, is. we have, um, we're using HubSpot as our CRM on our, mm-hmm. on our website, and we've been training the chatbot AI solution, which is beta. 
and this isn't a knock on on HubSpot, but I'm just going to make a comment in general. I'm fascinated with how the 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 level of I don't know, it's a phrase I'm looking for here. Companies are moving so fast with rolling out public available or their own, you know, as long as you're subscribing, here's our AI solution so mm -hmm. quickly that what we expect as consumers to be sort of like the baseline, it, it needs to work, right? We're accepting a lot of garbage right now because of this FOMO, fear of missing out. People are rolling out AI solutions so fast in their commercial products, but the results are not that great. Again, this isn't a specifically a knock on the CRM that we're using. But I'll give you a specific example. So uh, um, similar to what you're doing, if you go to Red Hawk's website and you chat with Hawkeye, that's what we affectionately named the, the AI. Wow, no Marvel lawsuit, lawsuit yet? No no cease and desist? Haw Hawkeye, you can find it in all kinds of literature and names, course, stuff like yeah. that. It's not, not a Marvel right. comic. We didn't use yep. any. There's no character there. <laughs> right. Yep. But uh, anyway, you can ask it. Um, we, we had one of our testers go in and they put in a question. They said, I need a quote for a project that includes large language model and an AI solution, et cetera, et cetera. So fairly lengthy question. How do I get that quote? And the chat bot came back and said, I don't understand your question. Do you want to try again? And so I looked at the knowledge base that we're training the AI model on also contained in the CRM platform. And we have all kinds of information about how to get a quote, but because those articles don't specify how to get a quote for AI with a large language model solution, it didn't know how to respond because it was so specific. Yeah. Now, if we were to open this up from a, na na a natural language processing perspective up to a, a public LLM, well, the intent from natural language process, it could, could in theory come back and say, oh, they're, they just generally need to know how to get a quote from Red Hawk. You guys will fill in the blanks and then come back with what's available in the one article we wrote about how to get a quote. Yeah. So that's an interesting little thing that I think a lot of companies will experience as they start really dialing in their own closed uh, AI solutions is how tedious and specific you have to be <laughs> in training that model to cover a massive variety of ways that people might ask it questions. Yeah. Well, that's why we, I mean, again, going back to that chat bot that we deployed back in 2005, mm. um, we were looking at the very long library of responses or of, of requests that had no response or an inaccurate response around that. And we're constantly fine tuning that there was no intelligence to go and get a, a partial. So it did like, if you capitalize versus lowercase, I mean, it was ridiculous. Oh, wow. yeah. So we had to put some basic Boolean logic in to be able to make minor adjustments because it wasn't out of the box in the app. Mm -hmm. um, it's like literally what you plugged in there, but there's a couple of things that we learned back then where we saw the pattern of here's like the five things that, 80% of people asked for. So instead we put it as like a hyperlinked list of like the most common questions right at the top. Most people that clicked on that and didn't go to the search to uh, with an open question. Um, but I mean, you need to do something similar and now it's much smarter again, depending on the, the LLM and, and the location of your library, but it's, it's, it more easily picks up on those, nuances around basic language things. Like mm -hmm. I said, like I, I did this, my first power platform training class, I did a week long course uh, with a company called Collab365 out of the UK. They're, they're fantastic folks. If you're looking for, for Microsoft 365 training uh, online, but um, I, I took that and I realized a couple of things very, very quickly. Like one, how incredibly powerful it was. Like I went and trained it with a couple examples mm -hmm. and my first test that I did myself, I used completely different phrase, like same words. It was a, a travel request thing. And I just mm -hmm. said, like, I put in, you know, I'm, I'd like to request is, was the training. And then I started just putting in, I want to get out of here for a week. Can I go on this day? Like, and it took that, it understood it uh, because the semantic, you know, model behind it and was able to go and make that translation. And I don't have to then go program it to understand that exact phrasing. Um, but yeah, it, it's a, but it's a constant tuning. It's constantly up again. It goes back to what we've been talking about. It's like, it's not a build it, 
you're done, walk away. Yeah. It's an, it is an ongoing operational activity to refine that, but then you'll be spending less and less time on that. It, it will do more and more mm -hmm. as you move forward. Yeah, absolutely. And if it's going to be a solution that your customers, if they're paying customers are going to be using, then uh, it, it becomes even more important to measure the quality of the responses over a period of time and decide what your threshold is. Is it 85% accuracy? Is it 98% accuracy? What are you looking for before you feel like it's going to meet the need of that paying customer? Uh, you know, I think there's a lot more leeway if it's an internal facing solution and that knowledge worker knows and can recognize at a glance that that's not quite right. And if that's the case, then you have the opportunity to include the human in the loop as part of the workflow automation, wherever you're trying to get improvement to train the model, measure the response, allow that person to say that's incorrect, provide some additional information that the model can train on and then measure the next time, right? So that this is something I think that a lot of companies need to really be thinking about is, is what is the process, the recurrent process to train and improve the quality of the output? That should be part of the project discussion. You you didn't include the one other, the Google model, which is just slap the word beta on it and leave it that way for years. <laughs> for years, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, so so Matt, final question for you. So, so how do you envision really the future uh, of AI and software development? Is there anything like you privy to like, like where things are shifting and going? Are you participating in those circles with kind of leaders in tool development? Yeah, I think what we're going to continue to see big investments made in automating code generation on the generative side. I think it's going to take a long time for it to produce solutions that are commercial ready. I just don't think the generative side of, of code creation is anywhere near where it needs to be or anywhere I think, near I think where Git, I think the GitHub Copilot is like by far the, 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 the most successful, the broadest adoption uh, and, and people happy with it. Like the numbers are big on that. Uh, they are, and our team loves it and we're using it a lot. In fact, that's the solution I was referring to earlier in the conversation around, um, you know, simple ways to get value from it, which is, hey, yeah. this, this function doesn't have any comments, write comments, tell me what this function's doing and vice yeah. versa, write the comments and say, create a function for this. And then, uh, but you still need to look at what it's generating because sometimes it's not appropriate for whatever it is that you're building and you have to add to it, but it is, a co-pilot, it's not the pilot, as you mentioned earlier as well. And I think that's a really good, really good way to brand what they're doing. It's an assistant. Yeah. Uh, but the way that we're looking at it is uh, because we do support and maintain those custom applications for our clients, we're looking at efficiency gain on the maintenance support. So what can we do? And this is a question that's not answered for us yet. How might we use generative AI to update frameworks, plugins, and libraries in order to secure, maintain the security of that application and remediate the code. Um, it, it, it's, I don't have a good answer for how well, that's gonna play out, but it's something we're investing in. That's actually, that's one of the, uh, the, one of the things, a couple of the, what I was sharing my prompt engineering kind of best practices with this session that I led last week. Um, a couple of them were around research. I and mean, this is a clear example of where you could enter in like all of your software development practices. You could, uh, you could provide, uh, if you, if you do like postmortems on customers, on projects, things like that, all those learnings into that, all of that in there. And then you could start asking it questions of, you know, and, and based on this, uh, you know, how can we better improve in, in these areas? Like I'm leveraging it for clients where we leverage the Microsoft 365 maturity model is something mm -hmm. that I, I consult around uh, to help them better understand. There's a lot of data you have to input around that. Sure. Part of the reason why we're using the private, you know, the co-pilot version. Absolutely. Um, but then to go and start asking for insights and suggestions saying, here's, here's the best practice here's where the customer is based on the gaps there. What are your suggestions? Where should we prioritize? What needs to be worked on and starting to get insights out of that. It's just incredible uh, is to see that. So you could start building a model suggestion for all those that are watching or listening to, to go and start. And you could, 
again, don't put proprietary information, but you could take the broader learnings of public information, build it into like chat GPT or leverage copilot or things that are out there and train the model. I prefer like chat GPT just because you can retain your, uh, your conversations, your threads versus copilot. Every time you go in something new, it forgets and it, it really only tracks. It's like 30 or 40 interactions where chat GPT just keeps going as long as the instance is open. Mm -hmm. But you can, as you learn about new technologies, new things, you can say, you can go feed it in. Here's the net new thing, like um, based on what I already know, but with this new information, would that change your recommendations of what I would go look into? I mean, just fascinating ways that you could explore and research this, you know, this technology to go in. It, it's such a fun time. Yeah. It is, I, it is. It's so cool what we can do these days and, and ways that you can leverage this tech, just like you're describing it, to find ways to improve the customer experience and improve your business. Yeah. And, and we're making those investments as well. We're, we're leveraging data from Azure DevOps. We're leveraging data from the software bill of materials and common vulnerabilities and exposures that are being detected. We're bundling all that with contract data. We're doing all kinds of stuff. I can't share a lot of the details with you because you're not a client, but maybe someday. <laughs> it's and one of the things we've not talked about too. And again, going back to my, my roots is that I, I'm excited about from a project management standpoint, all the tools around project management alone, mm -hmm. getting stronger integration in and better alignment between all the development activities. And I know there's products out there. Again, Microsoft has their DevOps product itself, but I mean, all of that is getting so much better mm -hmm. and, and stronger. So um, yeah, I think there's a lot to be excited about. Thanks. Well, Matt, I really appreciate you coming on the show. And uh, so folks, I mean, I've got your contact information out there. Definitely go take a look at, at your redhawk-tech.com, the website. I'll have the links and over to Matt, your profile out on the blog of the podcast. But yeah, I mean, any other, any other pitch of uh, your customer pitch for people that want to find out more or work with you guys? Yeah, the just last thing I would add is is that um, you know our focus is on serving mid market clients that are innovating. Uh, they're trying to find ways to grow quickly, improve operations, et cetera, and they know they need technology to do it. So, um, and if you've already invested in something, that's an area that of expertise we provide as well as taking on support, maintenance, and enhancement of existing custom software solutions, which is hard to find. Most of our competitors really only want the greenfield work, but um, I'm open to conversations and, and ideation sessions. So I look forward to hearing from folks that are listening to the podcast and I'm grateful to be here. Thank you, Christian. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcast, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.